Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. We're very excited by your presence today at the seventh lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Media, Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Ash Amin, a Professor of Geography at the University of Cambridge and the Swedish Research Council's 2021 Olof Palme Visiting Chair at the University of Uppsala, who is here to deliver the much anticipated talk titled Space slash subject, Vernaculars of Endurance in Delhi's Slums and Streets. We will be recording today's lecture, and at the same time, it's being live streamed on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Amin's talk, and all of you requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will be then addressed to Professor Amin. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Manotra. I request Simi Ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor Amin. Right, thanks, Suman. Uh, Professor Ash Amin, our esteemed speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us from different parts of the world and from different time zones, I, on behalf of the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Würzburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark supported Distinguished Lecture Series. Friends, we are delighted to welcome you to the seventh lecture of this series, which is a part of the ongoing collaborative project on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We are extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Ash Amin, one of the leading intellectuals of our times, as our speaker this evening. It is indeed an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Amin, and we are all eagerly waiting to hear him speak on space subject, vernaculars of endurance in Delhi slums and streets. I'm extremely grateful to you, Professor Amin, and I thank you profusely for indulging us and for so readily agreeing to be a part of our series. It is indeed an honor for us, Professor Amin. I extend a very warm welcome once again to all of you. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Amin formally, though I know he needs no introduction here or anywhere in the world. Professor Ash Amin is Professor of Geography at the University of Cambridge and the Swedish Research Council's 2021 Olof Palm uh, Visiting Chair at the University of Uppsala, Sweden. He is known for his work in urban, cultural and economic geography. He writes about cities and regions as relationally constituted, globalization as everyday process, the economy as cultural entity, race and multiculture, the intersection of biopolitics and vernacular practices, slums and dwelling practices, and the changing meanings of Europe. He has held fellowships and visiting professorships at a number of European universities. I cannot possibly list them all. He's been a founding co-editor of the Review of International Political Economy and is on the advisory board of a number of international journals. He's also a fellow of the British Academy and of the Academy of Social Sciences. He holds an honorary doctorate from, from Uppsala University and was foreign secretary of the British Academy from 2015 to 2019. He was awarded a CBE in 2014 for his contributions to social science. Professor Amin's recent research includes work on new urban grammars, so slum ecologies and dwelling practices, the mental health of the poor in Shanghai and Delhi, and identity conflicts in a, in, in a populous Europe. His latest books include Lands of Strangers, which was published in 2012 from Polity, Arts of the Political, which was published from Duke in 2013, Seen Like a City, uh, from, again from Polity in 2016, and Grammars of the Urban Ground, uh, which was again published, uh, uh, or is in press, I think, at the, the Duke University Press. He's currently writing a book uh, on frames of coexistence, which considers biopolitical alternatives to xenophobic nationalism. Uh, Professor Amin, it is such an honor, it is such a privilege for us to really have you here, and I can't really thank you for your generosity with your time and with your scholarship. It is such an honor, Professor Amin, and we're really waiting to hear you speak. Over to you, Professor Amin. Professor Malhotra, Simi, thank you so much for your very kind introduction, and I have to say the honor really is mine, and what, what an extraordinary series that you're running. Um, I approach my topic in over the next uh, 40 or 50 minutes with a degree of trepidation, I have to say, because I'll be talking about my research in Delhi, about people and places that many of you um, will be familiar with. So uh, allow me to use one of Simi's words, allow me this indulgence. 
So the broad, the broad question that I want to pose is, how do we speak of the subjectivity of the poor, those li living on the urban margins, without reducing them to the language of victims or heroes? How can we recognize habitat and how habitats are dwelt by people as more than incidental in shaping people's well-being, bodily well-being and also mental uh, health? So these are the questions, if you look at the first slide, these are the questions that I've been pursuing with my work with Lisa Richard on the mental health of rural migrants flocking daily to China's rapidly growing cities, who are widely believed in the social science research to be strangulated by modern city life. Uh, so here the literature speaks of uh, a cultural uh, shock to the rural mind and of the city posing very many existential challenges related to, by and large, exclusion and poverty. And this kind of thinking follows a new line of thinking in epidemiology and a very old proposition in sociology that reduces mental disorders in the city to uh, the modern city's bewildering pace of life and its multiple deprivations, deprivations experienced especially by the poor. And our work has been based in Shanghai. Um, whoops. Why is that not working? Uh, apologies for these folks. Okay, let's see, that, that might work. Um, so in our ethnographic work in two neighborhoods, one in a, an outer suburb facing rapidly factory closures along, along Tongli uh, Road in Juting, and the other one, a last remaining low rise block in the central business district called Fuzhou Road, where young migrants work in low paid service jobs, we found very little evidence of the migrants suffering from severe mental disorders. The, of course, not mild, mild disorders uh, like uh, sleep deprivation or anxiety. Um, we also found very little evidence of these migrants relying on either modern or traditional therapeutic cures. Yet our informants emphatically and always spoke of facing the unrelenting, unrelenting pressures of precarity. The Chinese word is yali. Um, so they spoke of precarity, uncertainty, family obligations, having restricted welfare rights, and by and large, pretty difficult living and working conditions. Okay, Yali encapsulated for them all of these things. So what we discovered nestled between Yali on the one hand and mental breakdown were what I would call rituals of living the moment or rituals of placemaking. So for example, amid ruination in Juting, the place that was experiencing factory closures, we found workers and the self-employed negotiating the threat of, of a lost livelihood and also of neighborhood decline through various practices of slowing down time and finding ways of domesticating crisis. Here, the, the, the prosaic acts of homemaking, gathering for line dancing in the evening, sharing a cigarette, and gossip on the streets of playing cards and watching soaps on phones to stave off boredom and doom turned out to be really quite significant, as you can see on the top two images. And in contrast, or similarly in Fuzhou Road in the city center, we found here by and large young rural migrants working in the service sector enduring low paid and precarious jobs through rituals of daily banter, casual friendships, 
uh, finding respite in the, in the city center's beautiful public libraries and constructing hope by browsing through self-help books in bookshops. Okay, so there were all kinds of everyday rituals of kind of, if you like, coping with Yali. And here we found evidence uh, against sweeping accounts of subjugation by the metropolis of subjectivity shaped in everyday dwelling practices, in the iterations of mind, body, and habitat. The choreography of the body in the city and of the city in the body was turning out to be quite pivotal in the making and management of mental states. So I've pursued this interest in cityness and mental health through a new project on the poor in Delhi, uh, which began in January 2020 and has been abruptly interrupted by the pandemic shortly after. And over a few weeks at the time, working with my uh, uh, research collaborator, Gunjesh Kumar, and also guided by my colleague at Cambridge, Man Barua, I set out to understand the reciprocities of mental states, life circumstances, and settlement conditions in two places. So it's a similar kind of methodology as in Shanghai, but on this occasion in, in Delhi. So the, the first area, as you see on the left side of my screen, um, is an old unauthorized colony um, in South Delhi, not far from JNU, where some 100,000 people are crammed in some 15,000 small dwellings of vernacular build, um, um, Bakka build, not Kacha build, in tightly packed, tightly packed in narrow alleyways. And this, this uh, colony, Kusumpur Pahari, is a thriving 30 to 40 year old slum close to the jobs and amenities in a prosperous part of South Delhi. Many of you will know this. Um, and although poor and surviving under const the constant shadow of eviction, the colony is highly differentiated socially and economically and has benefited from service upgrading, in, particularly in recent years, bringing in free water, electricity, waste disposal, and public toilets. Private life here spills over into the streets the domestic and the commercial are intricately interlaced, while the built environment, crowded, rudimentary, and often badly kept, folds into daily life in really quite intricate and intimate ways. The second area, the other two images you see on my screen, is a strip of land along the Yamuna in Old Delhi called Yamuna Pushta where the homeless live in makeshift tents or temporary shelters run by uh, an NGO, at least until the pandemic, when I believe uh, the, the homeless were unceremoniously evicted. This place bears no resemblance whatsoever to Kusumpur. On the upper level of the strip, strip are located the shelters toilet blocks, food vans, and penny traders such as barbers, and on the lower level, running down to the river, camp out the homeless in, in rudimentary shelters um, dispersed amidst, as you can see, amidst the trees, amidst heaps of rubbish, and a massive, massive uh, water pipe. And during our cold days there, the homeless wandered around in blankets, as you can see, they huddled around meager fires or watch films in one or two makeshift cinemas, most of them craving food, drinks or drugs, some of them exhausted from having very, very uh, hard, difficult day jobs. And in this space of bare survival, the male migrants, and most of them are male, are stretched to breaking point, with many of them troubled with physical and uh, mental disorders, quite, quite severe ones, and troubled also by substance addiction and extreme isolation and stigmatization. 
Here, the habitat offers no respite, really, of any kind. So what I want to do in today's talk is I want to personify, and this word will become clear in a minute, I want to personify the states of mind that we encountered with an eye towards how biography and space are commingled in shaping these mental states. But I hasten to add, I'm not trying to ex uh, explain away at all the political economy of violence and exclusion that's daily endured by the poor. That remains steady and it's a constant, but I'm trying to add something more to a political economy approach on the afflictions of the poor. But first, before I do so, a quick word on my conceptualization of precarious subjectivity in the metropolis. In her celebrated book, Affliction, based in Delhi's low-income neighborhoods, Vina Das writes of illness and suffering folded into, I quote, the scenes of the everyday. The book encapsulates over 30 years of ethnographic work on state, legal, patriarchal, and economic violence uh, endure, rendered ordinary by the ongoing drama of survival played out in the open, as it were. A drama often felt by residents as a form of what she calls incomprehension in the lack of correspondence between affliction experienced as daily tribulation and somatic discomfort and received medical categorizations of trauma and its effects. There's a divorce between how the, the people on the ground explain their own circumstances and what the medics say is going on with them. Now, in Dasi's account, the prosaic and the abnormal merge and the suffering gets incorporated into the facts of survival and into the local, into a local vernacular, importantly, of endurance. Das implores us to heed the language of the field. And what, what's interesting in her narrative is that the agency of place, the affordances and the absences of local services, infrastructures, the built form, public spaces, tend to occupy a minor role in explaining affliction. But here we do have another body of work that delves into how practices of inhabitation work their way into subjectivity and life chances. I'm thinking of Joao Bill's powerful work following a woman called Katarina, Katarina's mental illness lived out between rooms and the open grounds in a Brazilian asylum. Philippe de Bouc's illustrations of uh, economic and other prospects created around broken roads, broken infrastructure, and broken buildings in Kinshasa. Brigu Singh's writing on how Sufi shrines in rural India and more recently in Delhi, including their spatial arrangements and the atmospheres that they create, count as part of the therapeutic care of the mentally ill. Michele Lanchona's close-up portrayal of living with heroin addiction in the underground caverns of Bucharest railway station, um, where the warm pipelines and the, and the cavernous or cavern furnishings play their part. And in turn, of course, within studies of slums in India, the commingling of materiality and subjecti subjectivity is richly illustrated in the work of a number of scholars, uh, Pushpa Arabindo, Amita Baviska, Ayana Datta, Asha Gertner, Nikhil Lanand, Colin McFarlane, Ravi Sundaram, just to, just to name a few of the scholars. And what these scholars do is they highlight the indispensable human and non-human intimacies um, arranged in making what Abdul Malik Simon calls making the un uninhabitable habitable and making slum subjectivities in equal measure. 
In a similar vein, um, me writing on the embodied brain, I'm thinking of the forthcoming book, work book by Nick Rose and Des Fitzgerald, is showing how, how is showing how mental disorders in cities are not of a shock response nature in the sense of an, uh, the urban environment destabilizing preformed subjectivities, but they show how these are formed in the living of specific environments, in the actual experience of space as lived place. Here, how urban space is rendered corporeal, how the mind is formed in living through things, I quote Kathleen Stewart, is considered key in the balances of mental health. We see this illustrated by Hester Parr in, in, in her study of street, the street choreographies of unwell people in Glasgow by the geographer Soda Soderstrom in his walks through Neuschattel with people with severe mental disabilities, where the walking shows that these people feel safe or threatened in very distinctive atmospheric conditions and particular places. In, and in, we find this also in similar work on the embodied vulnerable mind by Cameron Duff and David Bissell. In all this work, mental disorders are not at all played down. They're simply located in bodily experience, where the experience folds also habits of habitat into the neuroscience of the brain. This is the kind of the new genius of this work, I think. So, Let's look at the intricacies of space, spatial subjectivity understood in this way by unpacking the states of endurance or non-endurance that I encountered, firstly in Kusumpur Pahari and then in Yamuna Pushta. And what I'm trying to do here in, in my account is I'm trying to look, draw out the connections between mental well-being and dwelling practices. And importantly, following Vinadas, I really do want to stay close to the language of endurance or and language of subjectivity used by our interlocutors. So the first one then. Um, the first person we met in Kusumpur on a cold January day feeling rather anxious about whether anybody was going to talk to us about something as important and sensitive as mental well-being, was somebody who I'm calling Surenda, who is a caretaker at JNU and a part-time pig keeper. Fortunately for us, we were welcomed by him immediately, and we were quite surprised to hear how openly he spoke about the difficulties of slum life. He talked about the cramp housing, the constant threat of eviction, the wayward behavior of some neighbors, the graft of keeping his children on the right side so that they can follow a safe and decent prospect, and many other things. And unsolicited, Surrender also chose to speak of the very fine line between survival and failure. Um, by talking about uh, the trials that his family faced, when he once broke his leg, which nearly led to his bankruptcy and the loss of his job. Luckily, he was helped out by his extended family. And then when I asked him what kept him going, without a moment's hesitation, he stamped his herding stick on the ground and he spat out Majbuti. And the Hindi word, if I've got it right, in English means toughness which surrender understood to mean and some kind of an inner determination not to fail. And then later, in another part of the colony, we met one of the senior residents um, with a great big handlebar moustache and a booming voice who displayed all the confidence of an old timer. In fact, we quickly learned that he was an old timer. Um, how he had built a two-story house, which is quite rare in, in this busty, in, in a quiet corner of the colony, um, by claiming a large plot when the settlement was uh, semi-rural and very sparsely populated about 30 years ago. 
and then how we managed to grow uh, a very successful truck and construction business. Constantly swearing, and but also thanking God for his good fortune, um, this man who I'm calling after the great Indian actor Prithviraj progressed to talk about precarity and stress by mentioning how he lost all his assets when he had to pay for his son's kidney condition. Everybody's got an issue of this kind. But unbowed, he expressed his contentment with living in, in Kusumpuri amidst familiar neighbors, his standing in the community, his past achievements, and he talked about his generosity to others. When we were there, a woman came, came, came by to ask him for some leaves from his neem tree, and he observed her seriously, and then said, yes, you can take a, a, a few leaves. So this man's bodily form, uh, assessed from his voice to his moustache, to how he stood, his confidence, oozed Majbuti. He, he was Majbuti. Now, from these encounters, it would be very easy to stay with personality traits and personal biographies to explain the, these two people's tenacity. But I think a more complete picture has to acknowledge the affordances of the urban fabric. The infrastructural improvements that have taken the sting out of the daily grind of meeting basic needs. The serendipitous opportunities that arise from conversations and observations that happen in public space, where the private cup spills out into the public. Of course, we have to acknowledge also the role of family ties uh, and familiarity in, in neighborhood and its ways, the colony's proximity to a prosperous part of South Delhi, and above all, absolutely above all, the, the hard graft of wives and daughters who enable the men's toughness. In fact, the gendered character of Majbuti was really telling, um, with women choosing to frame, frame their strength in the language of putting up with the almost unbearable load of keeping family and home intact, suggesting that a better term to describe their condition would be, in, in English at least, forbearance. Um, Sahan Shakti, Sahan Shilta. As a, as a kind of key word, not much Muthi. So that's what I want to uh, pass on to now, if I may. It's women, young and old, who hold together the life in the colony, typically waking up before dawn to get the family ready for the day, perhaps going out to paid work, and staying up late to finish duties. Violence against the women from husband is common, bringing them at the edge of severe mental disorders, such as acute depression, often described by themselves, go back to Vinadasya, as a form of listlessness and distraction. Uh, they somatize what are mental uh, 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 difficulties. They endure, um, convinced to be free from mental disorders. In fact, they can't afford to go down with mental disorders. Um, yet they remain all too close to the edge of desperation, which is often when the familiarities of place and neighborliness intervene, which is what I want to try and uh, illustrate with two cases. Gita, in her late 40s, lost her husband in 2016 and is left with a one rupee lakh outstanding loan on her husband's rickshaw, that's about 1,000 pounds. She's poor, without a job, and has three children, a son who works and two daughters who's married, whose marriage costs are looming. Her circumstances are truly challenging. And yet by character, she appeared to us at least as optimistic, outspoken, and resolute, strong. Confident that she could get the rickshaw back into service. Here in our observations, I think place also played its part because it offered neighbors from her region, uh, Bihar, in whom she could confide. It offers free water and electricity, a modest 
cost-free home. She owns her home, of course. And it offers plentiful outdoor conversations from which opportunities might arise, including how she revives the rickshaw. And it offers some elevation of her worries when she gathers with other women from Bihar uh, when they collect um, drinking water when the municipal trucks arrive once a week, as you can see. Her subjectivity, including her forbearance, is performed with and through the intimacies of place. To turn to the second example, in an opening not far from Gita's alleyway, where a municipal toilet block is located, top right hand side of the slides, on most days we found a group of women huddled around the fire fed by wood taken from the nearby forest. These were widows or abandoned women facing steady decline, who described themselves as neglected in every respect, including by government and by the neighborhood. And if they spoke with some defiance about not giving up, their eyes betrayed a much deeper desperation in the face of extreme poverty. Um, reduced to only the familiarities of place and each other's company. And I think their fall at the time we felt was just a matter of time and it may well be a very hard fall. Um, but equally their tenacity just couldn't be denied um, as we witnessed in the, in the demeanor of one of their acquaintances who was standing right next to them, who stood there in, a, in the best clothing that she could, she could find, um, trying to sell children two penny snacks and sweets from an upturned box as these kids came out of primary school at lunchtime. This woman too is alone. She too has dependents to feed. She too is desperate. And yet, paradoxically, fleetingly, you note that this little opening near the toilet block and the nursery gives her the slimmest of chances to trade with familiar people. She could certainly not survive, but she can get by. So if place so far has appeared as a kind of an affordance, keep, keeping severe mental illness at bay, Yamuna, Yamuna Pushta, the second place that I, we studied, is a space in which habitat, socioeconomic circumstances, and life biographies come together to reinforce mental instability. Okay. Here, the role of intermediaries, such, such as NGOs providing care services um, in regulating the fine line between bare life and hope is absolutely pivotal. And let's see how, how this works before I conclude my talk. So typically, in Yamuna Pushta, the men sheltering under flimsy bamboo structures, which are draped in cloth, cloth and plastic, have become homeless after a family feud or an accident, or after years of poverty and migration in search of work, where sometimes they're left without those vital identity documents that would give them access to some form of welfare care. These men, at best, manage to find three or four days of work a month uh, pulling as, as load pullers or cleaners or assisting at uh, marriages by cleaning the dishes. And they spend the rest of the time, that's something like 27 days of the month, um, passing the day by playing Ludo or cards, sitting around fires, walking around, sifting through the rubbish uh, for recycling uh, items waiting for that hour in the evening to get intoxicated or lounging in the cinema tent that you can see. These are damaged men, mercifully fed by the NGOs and, and who, have, who do have access to free water and sanitation on the upper ledge of the pushta, but without which their physical, mental and medical vulnerabilities would descend, I'm sure, to the worst forms of bare life. In fact, they're not that far off. Their safety net is flimsy, 
and the surroundings are in, 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 inhospitable without any of the supportive social, physical, and commercial infrastructure of Kusumpuri. So in this situation, uh, the presence of NGOs, such as the Center for Equity Studies, what, of which one of the directors is Harsh Mandar, which provides temporary housing for men of a certain age, and also helps the homeless to access cards, ration cards, blankets, identity cards, and medical treatment in drug and other recovery centers is the vital thin thread to a possible life. Let's see. Let me quickly, because time is running short, just to sketch a, to sketch a portrait of three people to illustrate the role of intermediation in spaces in which the affordances of uh, neighborhood and neighborliness, the affordances of habitat are absent. And with this emphasis on intermediation, remind ourselves of the vital role of organized care in the making of well being. I'm thinking here of community centers, shrines, temples, shops and of course, educational and medical services in Kusumpur Pahari. And in, 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 in the case of Yamuna Pushta, the all too important NGO. Not NGOs, just one NGO. So three quick examples. One lucky resident of the, of the NGO housing shelter, uh, so not everybody can get into the housing shelters on a, on a more than temporary basis, is, is Milan. Milan is a man in his mid 50s who, amazingly for us, perhaps we were too ignorant, he spoke perfect English. He told us of his journey from childhood in a prosperous family, but then with a gambling father who squandered everything, to becoming a store manager in Lucknow and ending up in Delhi 10 years ago after a series of what he calls mishaps. Troubled by asthma, Milan um, could, couldn't work, but he did express his gratitude for the free housing, food, and services he received. He knew um, what was keeping him alive and going. And he was ever hopeful that with the help of official papers that our interlocutor, Gufran, was helping him with, and with the help of medicine that the Center for Equity Studies was procuring for him, he could potentially return to work free of, from his asthma. What was really striking to us was his hope, but also the role of threadbare community care programs in sustaining his hope. In Yamuna Pushta, there are very few women, but we met one of these women residents, bottom left, um, living with her son and a young nephew in a makeshift tent close to the river. And her story is disturbly, disturbingly moving. Calmly, the woman we are calling Devi spoke of having to sell her house 10 years ago to, find, to fund treatment for cancer, of seeing her husband die in an accident around then, and of taking in her nephew when her sister and her, and her husband were killed while crossing the road. Devi told us about selling her own kidney to, ma to make ends meet and about being able to survive in Yamuna Pushta because of the freely available food and services. And because her son sporadically can find work in Old Delhi. If place has played its part, it's because she's been, she has been allowed to build a shelter. And once again, because of the proximity to work and above all to services. The clearance of the strip during the pandemic, I think will have taken everything away. My final example is a young woman who I'm calling Zainab. And she's really luck lucky to be living with her two young children in um, one of the permanent shelters run by the NGO for the homeless close to 
Jama Masjid. Compared to uh, Yamuna Pushta, the shelter is a haven for women with young children uh, who are able to lead a substance-free life in a leafy compound where there are two or three dormitories, kitchens, and also play areas. And you can see some of those images there. Only the very few are able to get into these rare permanent shelters, which can become home. For Zainab, who is now a paid volunteer, the shelter has been that one lucky break in a life riddled with misfortune. With quiet and unhesitating eloquence, and she really was eloquent, Zainab told us about how her life as a, about, sorry, about her life as a child beggar at, at Jama Masjid, later uh, becoming a drug addict and a prostitute, a resident of the rehousing slum in faraway Bawana, where she lost her son in a fire, and where she witnessed her one-year-old daughter being raped by a man they knew, and then becoming a separated wife who struggled against all the odds to go clean so as to provide for her children. Zainab's mixture of fortitude, it was a kind of a majbuti actually, and her forbearance was, were all too evident. But so was the care of the NGO, the serendipity of the presence of the NGO in its offer of care, in its offer of counseling, in its offer of shelter, and of course, community. So let me then conclude, and I have no idea how badly I'm doing with time. This, what this study has done is it, it set out to look at the reciprocities of place and body in the making of states of mind. Behind the chaos, the cramped conditions and existential challenges that we find in Kusumpur Pahari, just like in so many of India's multitude of informal settlements, you find a neighborhood vernacular woven into practices of endurance. This comes in the form of, firstly, peaceful social efforts of housing and infrastructural upgrading, culminating in the installment of free public services. Secondly, neighborhood familiarities and socialities of various kinds. Thirdly, the easy spillover of the private into the public, where uh, private cares can be temporarily suspended. Fourthly, the steady arrival of NGOs offering creches and primary education, practical training opportunities, especially for women, and all importantly, medical facilities. And fifthly, these scattering of shrines and temples and wayside resting places, and also public spaces like the Maidan, where moments of stillness are found, along with the chance to exchange news. In all of this, it's not community that's at work, but instead place made habitable in socially intimate ways. And I think this is a really important dis distinction between the, the fictions of community and the intimacies of place. But this intimacy, let's be clear, is no substitute for the wider political economy of provisioning and, re and recognition that always keeps the poor um, in India and beyond without sustenance and always culturally neglected. I'm not trying to romanticize place and how it is inhabited in, in explaining mental health. Yet, in Yamuna Pushta, the sheer bare bareness, the barrenness of everything, the sameness of bare life, and the very rudimentary nature of habitat do conspire against body and mind. Place here is an encumbrance, is not an affordance. Um, reducing mental well-being to inner resolve, good fortune, bodily strength, and various forms of escape into the phantasmagorical through drugs and drink. Here, personhood is tested to the limit and multiple deprivations, discrimination, indignities and um, self-abuse uh, prevail as a result. Here, 
the significance of the care industry, if you could call it that, uh, in India so heavily dependent on serendipitous municipal effort and underfunded NGOs simply can't be overstated. Take away the shelters, the mobile clinics, the centers that treat drug addicts and the mentally ill, the committed NGO workers and volunteers, but also the strides taken by the Delhi authorities in recent years to attend to the poor. Uh, the homeless in Yamuna Pushta would be in a much worse state. To be clear, the support is, is the provide, support provided is basic, it's sporadic, and it's stretched, no doubt. But it is a lifeline for the few who manage to get access. For example, you know, let's be clear, the recovery shelters in, of Delhi catch some 100s out of some 200,000 homeless people in the city. And only five of them, sorry, 5% of them possess the identity documents needed to get access to food rations and medical care. There's a long way to go. So to close, COVID has wiped out the care industry in places like Yamuna Pushta. It has stigmatized the homeless even more, now described as carriers of disease. And it, it has forced the desperate into even worse circumstances in a city in which their survival actually depends on the presence of crowds in the street who can offer possibilities of some kind. The, afford the affordances of place in, in Kusumpur Pahari will also have evaporated, I'm pretty sure, as COVID forces residents back into the dark interiors. There probably isn't much of an outside life that proved to be so vital in negotiating mental health. I shudder to think what has happened to the people whose articulacy, whose forbearance, and whose affirmation I found so moving during my research. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Professor Meen. I mean, that was such a riveting talk. I mean, and I'm so grateful that you've shared such vital research that you've done. And we'd be really sad that after January 2020, you've not been able to come. I'm sure, uh, you know, post COVID, your visit again to probably Kusumpu Pahari and to Yamuna Pushta will probably open another story and another way of thinking about what would have happened to all the categories that you invoked in, in the face of what may constitute, you know, subjectivity and endurance, especially in places like this. But I mean, you've given us so much of food for thought, uh, Professor Amin, and I'm sure uh, we will think through these categories. I mean, you, 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 you know, you've give, given us so many categories to think with, and especially categories like Yali and you know what we what you translated as precarity and you know precarious subjectivity, which gets formed, uh, and you know, I mean, how vital the roles of intermediaries are. I mean, and and I think what you underscored is also very important, which is that while there is certainly a political economy of the slums and of the streets, in some senses, one cannot only have that particular lens to look at, you know, these precarious subjectivities which actually get constituted through everyday practices of, of neighborly, neighborliness and then how important and vital that can be. Even simple things like livelihood and commerce and space can be so important. And I think the in intimacies of space, what you said, I mean, because we so much lay importance on, co on community. Uh, uh, we've seen that actually place and the intimacy of place can actually play such a vital role. And especially in these contrasting pictures, which you've shown to us, one can through a story just because of the neighborliness and the kind of opportunities which are available as something which can actually fortify and probably have stories of, of fortified existence of, of, of uh, you know, even across genders, what you talked about, forbearance and of, of uh, uh, you know, majbuti or strength or whatever one may call it, uh, and how, you know, uh, how the how the subjectivities gets constituted, especially in places like Yamuna Pushta uh, and, uh, you know, the kind of work that Harsh Mandar and Center of Equity Studies has been doing is so, so vital, uh, and we're all aware of that. So, uh, Professor, I mean, there's so much to talk about, and I'm sure I don't want to stand between you and uh, and, uh, you know, the audience and the questions that they have, but I'm just reminded of one particular story of mine, which is that uh, long ago, I used to look after what is called the outreach program of the university. 
Uh, and uh, we had started to work with the unorganized sector and especially women uh, in the neighborhood of Jamia, of Jamia Nagar. Uh, and we had thought that, you know, and so with some researchers and with some faculty members, we'd done a survey and we'd found out what are the kind of trades that they, uh, and livelihood practices that they follow. Uh, and uh, and we, we had, you know, zeroed down on some set of women who, who were primarily artisans and work with hand. I mean, not really artists, but artisans and everyday things like, you know, chip cowing, bindi and, you know, filling socks in, in plastic bags and things like that uh, and so we uh, we you know we tied up with the governmental agency and tried to give them some cards you know of artisan cards and things like that and we'd organized a big program and we had uh, you know um, uh, Ravish Kumar who had done a show uh, on them on these unorganized sector women and you know they all came and he came and you know people from NABAD and from banks and SAGs and uh, you know from the Ministry of Handicraft etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and and ultimately I mean you know I was reminded of, of how important these cards are uh, because uh, I had hordes of women coming from the neighborhood asking that where is that madam who gives us Russian cards and you know who gives us cards through which we can actually survive. So I mean stories of hope which actually do uh, you know mapped on to these cards which are so vital and important in some senses. So I was just reminded of that particular story. But Professor, I mean such a rich talk. I mean we're so grateful uh, to you for the work that you do and the work that you shared with us. I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions from the audience. So thank you, Professor I Amin, mean, once again. So so grateful to you. So over to my colleague. Yes. Hello, Professor Amin. I mean, it was truly a pleasure listening to you. Uh, I could go on, but instead of, you know, taking up more time, perhaps I should move to the task at hand, which is to handle the question answer session. And we have uh, several questions, uh, but I mean, I don't know about the time myself, but we're going to jump right into it. And if you permit me, I may club together two questions which, which are similar. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, and I'm assuming you'd prefer to answer one after the other as opposed to me reading all the questions at one go? No. One after the other. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So I'll start with the very first question. This is from Dr. Wafa Hamid. She writes, thank you for this fascinating and engaging talk, Professor Ramin. You've talked about the possibility of hope as well as community care in relation to bare life and dwelling. I was wondering, amidst this everyday life is precarious, how does grief interact with our sense of dwelling? For example, especially amidst, let's say, COVID. And also, maybe what becomes of the idea of home when the dwelling, a key aspect of home, itself might often become unhomely? Thank you. What a fascinating question. Um, in two parts, let me take it in reverse order. I think what COVID has really shown is the the fine line between home and homeliness. And we see this in the UK as well. When COVID has played, placed excessive pressure on home because people can't go out, then all the defects of home turn into a kind of a nightmare that you get from density and proximity with people for too long a time and domestic violence arising and you know so there, I mean there's so many things that could be said and so the when home is allowed to spill out onto the streets and the two then become a form of homeliness including neighborliness then I think you have this um, some of these dangers of um, of home becoming a kind of a closed pit um, are, are avoided. And I think in a similar way, I, mean, I don't have a huge amount to say about what happens with grief, but I think probably much of what I've talked about is tested by grief. I mean, it's well and truly tested by grief um, to the point when if grief becomes something beyond endurance and it becomes a no longer it suppresses any form of life force then I think the these fragile affordances that I've been talking about I think they they kind of melt away um, and you're left with um, very little you're left with your own kind of interiority, you're left with 
those small things that can help you through grief. On the other hand, I think if some of these affordances of place that I was talking about and the NGOs and the care industry remained intact, then paradoxically, I think their importance becomes even more pronounced precisely because of grief. Where do you turn in, in the middle of grief? Can I leave it at that? Thank you, Professor. Um, over to the next question. This is from Dr. Atsar Shah. He writes, Professor Ramin, thank you for such an informative and beautiful ethnographic account. Being a student of sociology, I would like to ask your observations on the pervasive culture of poverty as coined by anthropologist Oscar Lewis in the slums you studied. Did you, found, did you find any dynamism among the dwellers to change their lives or have they adjusted to dependency and marginality and feel that there is no escape? Can we understand their majboodi as their adjustment to sustain their lives or call it the structural violence perpetuated by the state? So all the people that I've been studying, Delhi, Shanghai, Cape Town, Belo Horizonte in, in Brazil are poor. They face, face the structural violence of the state and of a, a brutal economy. And they face the structural, the, the structural violence of uh, patriarchy and a whole host of historic um, inequalities, inequities and imbalances. But they're not victims. Okay. They are, nor are they survivors. They have agency. And that's, in a sense, been what I, my, the centerpiece of my work over the last decade or so. It's this agency that I'm trying to understand. It, it's not that kind of agency that you find in some slum writing, which portrays the poor as heroes, as entrepreneurs, as, you know, people who fly against all the odds. I, I have no sympathy with that kind of work. What it is, is it's an agency in which amidst all the constraints, amidst all the structural and non-structural violence, there's a sort of human will to prevail that endures. They remain poor, they remain cast out, they remain violated, but somehow they endure with varying shades and various degrees of capability, survivability, dignity, and the meeting of needs. Okay. But were they surrounded by a network of other forms of provision, a lot would change. A lot would change. Okay. I'm moving on to two questions. I'm clubbing together two questions with your permission. The first question is from Arokia, who asks, could you elaborate on the contribution, their contribution to the making of economic spaces of a metropolis. And the second question is from Pallavi Narayan, who asks, who says, Professor Ramin, thank you for the very engaging talk. What do you think about the rhythms of the slum in the city as against one at the city's periphery? Is there a rhythm of precarity in the city? Thank you. Um, I don't quite know what to say to Arokia's question. Perhaps they could come back with an uh, elaboration what they mean about the economic spaces of the metropolis. What's the link that they're trying to get me to address um, with all due respect? And the second one, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, I tend to agree with the general drift of thinking here that 
to be stuck out on the periphery is a, is worse than being stuck in the middle of the city and that's because to go back to the language of affordances you know to be out in bavana where a lot of people were ev evicted after the commonwealth games was a bit of a nightmare because they were stripped away from their connections from the places of work a lot of the women were then having to endure very long distances of commuting coming back into the city center to work as cleaners and maids and ditto with the men you know whereas the um one of the i was going to use the word beauties but i think that would be a bit over exaggerated i think one of the most interesting aspects of cities of indian cities and a few other cities around the world is that the informal settlements the unauthorized colonies remain in the city center close to opportunity you know close to um well and with the kind of possibility of a history of neighborhood formation like i tried to describe in the kusumpur pahari case um and a sense also that they belong to that the heart of the city right they might be socially considered to be marginal but oddly enough spatially they're not marginalized they they're still in the city center and i think these sorts of things matter a lot uh psychologically and of course in terms of economic opportunity no no question about that and it's and it's not a coincidence that one of the strategic responses to poverty in cities that want to claim world cities world world class city status and open their doors to international commerce and globalization is to strategically relocate the poor on the outskirts you know where they can be they can just become a number and a, and a, and and no longer present or an irritant in the in the new bourgeois city so i think they 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 should, they should be kept in the middle of the city thank you professor um i'll move on to the next question which is by ved prakash he asks i was curious about how the circulation of films take place in delhi slum and what role do these film screenings play in the collective healing of people who reside in slum that's a great question the i mean let's start with some basics i was staggered to find that there were two cinemas in yamuna pushta i just you know couldn't couldn't believe what was going on and they can watch i think is it five films for 10 rupees or three films for 10 rupees it's not a lot of money and um they their role is really quite significant so uh they warm places um very often people are just kind of lying and sleeping um and not watching the films some are actually watching the films and what you could say is that the films and the the ability to go into the shelters to watch the films and to leave kind of valuables protected as well by the person letting them into the cinemas is not a form of healing but a form of temporary abeyance i think it it's a it's it's a sort of it's a moment of relief that uh you know a, a chance to be in on an inside which is uh, far from comfortable but uh is 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 a lot better than you know the the i suppose the nothingness outside um it's only for some people though quite a lot of the other 
people living there, the homeless who are in work, they won't go in there, I don't think. Um, so it's, 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 in, in some ways, it's their the spaces for those who are particularly abject. Um, is healing the right word? I don't know. It may be, but it gets close to it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Abhishek Pantar. He asks, I was wondering the virtue, that is forbearance and strength, that we associate with the subjects inhabiting these slum spaces, a key to battle mental ailments and grief. Would it be possible that it may be juxtaposed by a certain bourgeoisie outlook on these subjects? Secondly, is there a specific study that explores questions of moral, immoral, and spiritual in connection with the spaces inhabited? How space shapes outlook? And would you say that the gaze mystifies or demys would you say that the gaze that mystifies or demystifies is problematic? Uh, thanks for that. I'm not entirely sure I understand the related questions. Um, but let me try my my best here. The, I mean, if there's an implication that this, you know, I'm picking up on the word bourgeois outlook. Um, it may be a bourgeois outlook. I am. I, um, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. What I do know is that the religious and the shrine practices and the kind of vernaculars and the languages used by the poor themselves um, are not insignificant. That they are compelling in their own right because they're actually quite meaningful for the individuals concerned in enduring the alienation and the violence that they suffer. So, And there's a really big question here, question here about you know, what is the researcher's responsibility when you're doing ethnographic work? Do you miss and over-interpret what you say, see? Or do you choose to encapsulate and represent it? And I openly accept, of course, there's always interpretation involved in, in all of these observations that are there, there is no true knowledge that emerges from the field. But I do think it's important, and, and this has been a learning for me over the last decade, it's, it's vitally important that we as intellectuals from the outside don't wade in with our, with our boots and suppress the vernacular intelligence that works in its own right both as a form of endurance, but actually also as a form of making sense of the world that people find themselves in. Um, <clears throat> and it could become a form of bourgeois indulgence, this perspective on the poor, if then you end up saying, well, that's okay. They're all right, the way they live. And they're doing just fine. They're actually materially and mentally happy, you know, and the problems of alienation and poverty can be ignored. I mean, in a sense, that's the classic response of the right, isn't it? Um, I don't, I, that's not where I'm coming from. I think the small step that I'm taking is, at this stage anyway, early in this research, is actually, I think it's about recognition, really. So, I'm really, I have no idea whether I've answered the question, the three questions which were put to me, but I'm sorry, I just, then I must have misinterpreted the question. No, but I, I think you answered that. Would you like me to go on? I mean, it's completely up to you. Uh, there are a couple more questions, but if you give me a number, I'll ask you just that many, or we can stop uh, 
with this. No, no, I mean, I, I'm very happy to take a couple more questions. That, that's just fine. I mean, as, as long as you don't mind indulging in me. <clears throat> Not at all. It's our pleasure. It's absolutely our pleasure. So perhaps I'll post two more or three more uh, if you'll indulge us. Uh, okay. So the next question is, um, yes, from Zera Mehdi. Hello, sir. In line with your observations regarding residents' mental health and especially their endurance capacity, do you think the variable of religion or religious communities play any role in these neighborhoods? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, in, in Kusumpur Pahari, um, one afternoon, we were taken into this um, beautifully curated space and super, super clean, which was a Sufi shrine. And the people came and went from there. And there were people suffering from really quite deep um, spiritual, I mean, mental health issues. And and the man who was working there, a very modest man, he by day is a driver, and then by evening and <clears throat> by weekend is a spiritual healer. Um, <clears throat> it, it became quite clear to us that for people and their relatives suffering from mental health, going to the shrine, all religions, by the way, huh? that's the beauty of it, was very important. How effective the going to the shrine and to this uh, man with insight was, nobody knows who's to know. But it, it, there was something going on, and particularly from the perspective of people who, in a sense, in the pre or the post rationalist society, you know, believe that the, your mental health is absolutely linked in with your spiritual uh, zeitgeist and outlook, um, that connection is, is important. And then when I met a very senior uh, psych psychiatrist at Ibas in Delhi, um, he immediately said, you know, um, looking forward, looking ahead, Psychiatry is going to have to come to grips with religiosity and um, forms of care and protection, um, so curative practices that come from um, uh, religious practice in some shape or form. And he said this, you know, with all sincerity. So not just because people believe, if you like, in the power of the word or, or, or the belief or the faith, but because he said, you know, there are the moment in which you accept that the mind is, is the product of so many different kinds of influences, then the liturgical, the, the spiritual, the quietude of being in a, in a, in a space can make a difference. And Brigu Singh in his work on Sufi shrines in India, in rural India and Rajasthan, and now he's just completing a book on a five-year project in Delhi, um, it just shows this in, in such an emphatic way that, that um, these shrines um, play their part. People go to them in hundreds and thousands, and far more than going to places like Ibas, you know, looking for medical cures. So there's a, let's put it this way, there's a challenge here that needs to be met. And part of meeting the challenge is absolutely um, not glorifying mysticism, but coming to recognize that uh, uh, religion and religious practice plays its part. Thank you, Professor. The next question is from Akshada. She says, hello, sir. I wanted to ask how and in what particular ways conflicts 
plays a role in the spaces that the presentation is based upon. Um, conflict is um, is everywhere. There's there's no doubt about that. You know, so um, these spaces that I studied, Yamuna Pushta is riddled with conflict, um, and it's of, of that kind in which people without means and without possibilities, leading these fairly abject lives, um, conflict breaks out all the time. And you know, especially with as a, with with substance abuse, um, you have theft as well. You have accusations going on. You know, this, this is a it's a war zone in some senses. Okay, and Nito, I think in Kusumpuri, you know, um, conflict is there as well. Um, you've got. Um, a Dalit community in the corner of Kusumpur that is kind of survives in that corner because it's Dalit and ostracized and held to be different. You've got a everyday domestic violence conflict endured by women is pretty pretty pervasive. You've got you've got conflict in the school schoolyard with kids you know there's conflict everywhere what i what i think it would be wrong to do is to say that the spaces of the poor are more conflict ridden and completely incapacitated by conflict you know it's a very interesting parallel here with research on, on the brazilian favelas Brazilian slums, you know, in which gang-controlled gang warfare, drug killings are so pervasive. And yet ethnographers who work on the Brazilian favelas don't reduce favela life and the kinds of thing that I've been talking about to conflict. You know, so conflict is it's in the air and it's and people find ways around it, ways through it, but there are also many, many casualties, no doubt about that. Thank you, Professor. May I ask you two more, or would you like me to stop with one? Two more. Okay, there we go. Let's, let's do two more and then stop. Yes, okay. So the next question is from Suchitra Singh. She says, thank you for this valuable talk. I would like Professor Raman to suggest methodologies for young academic researchers in the area of semi-urban and subaltern spaces, as well as the ways to overcome the preliminary dangers of fieldwork, given the presumptuous barrier between the researcher and these spaces. So, <clears throat> I mean, on methodologies, The mantra these days, mantra these days is um, co-production, mixed methods, mixing the quantitative and qualitative, and so on and so forth. Okay. What I would say is this: that the that the study of poverty in general and generic terms, and then you might do some comparative research between place A and place B, should never stray away from political economy, okay? But to understand you know, how the poor are part of, trapped in, why does, spheres and structures of influence. But equally, I think <clears throat> to stop there, the method, I mean, the methodology of counting, the methodology of political economy, the methodology of sociological surveys, the methodology of uh, big data, um, to stop there, I think is, 
is a bit deficient. Because, and I hope it's become clear in my talk, if you want to get close to the lives of the poor, then you have to get close to the lives of the poor. Then I think you need to go, go in to these places. You need to spend some time there. You need to leave no stone unturned. You need to go in with your field notes, rip them up and try, start again. You need to not go in there with a pre-prepared questionnaire survey. You need to go there um, attuned with, with an, and with a kind of capacity to listen and learn and to be, and to you kind of see yourself as an equal amongst others. And then you need all the allies that you can get in the field, you know. Um, and that's where I think co-production can become becomes really important, where you you are developing your research results and your research ideas in collaboration with the residents in that place, uh, key informants, people who kind of help you out, um, and hopefully if you can go into the field not just on your own but with uh, one or two other collaborators um, as long as you're not too visible then that that would really help you know so these are what are they what, what, how would you describe them? these are kind of humble practices of the ground uh, which i think are quite important <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the last question for this evening, afternoon there uh, is from Shivanki Chaturvedi. She says, thank you, Professor Raman, for such an informative session. My question is whether ideas of survival and belonging feed into each other or are they ensuing notions for the in inhabitants of Kusumpura and Yamuna Pushta? Sorry. Uh, yes. where, where, just repeat the question again, please. Sure, sure, sure. The question is whether ideas of survival and belonging feed into each other or are they ensuing, ensuing notions? Are they ensuing notions for inhabitants of Kusampura and Shamanabushta? I don't quite know how to answer that question, but I think my kind of instinctive response would be is that they feed each other. They absolutely feed each other because um, yeah, so, and, you know, a thought of the, of the cuff would be that the practices of survival are never that far from practices or orientations of belonging. If you see yourself, for example, as an outcast, and you are treated as an outcast, then the consequences are pretty much along that line. Survival becomes a struggle. If, however, amidst the worst conditions of survival, um, you see yourself or something um, around you, whether it's your family or the wider circumstances that surround you or the affordances of place or a national culture that you belong to says you belong, right? You may be poor, but you belong. Uh, this is your place as much as it is my place. You know, then, the, then these are illustrations of how the two absolutely go hand in hand and feed off each other and feed into each other and reinforce each other. So, you know, in the Brexit context, in the case of also the return of xenophobic nationalism in India, Poland, all over the world, um, it's precisely the breaking of this link that's become deeply problematic, right? Where the kind of over-exaggerated language of who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is supposed to belong, and who is not supposed to belong by religion, by caste, by whatever, 
by your very ideas, you know. If to be a liberal is to be an outcast, then the consequences of all of that, you know, because I think there's a integral relationship between survival and belonging, um, are really quite severe. Right? If you're deemed not to belong, imagine the consequences of that on your on your sense of self, on your mental well-being, and your very survival. Uh, it's so I don't think the relationship between the two necessarily is between the material and the cultural. They're yeah, like this; they go together. I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Zamin. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of the question on the session. And now, please allow me to invite Sakshi to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor. Good evening, everyone. It has been a wonderful event indeed. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made this event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank us so much to think about. We will no doubt be we will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time into the future. Uh, thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us, uh, sir. As always, uh, thank you to our uh, HOD Professor Simi Malhotra, who is the leading force behind this uh, lecture series and today's talk. Thank you to Suman, Shraddha, and Susan Zahara, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our events so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who turned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends. And we hope to see you all again very, very soon. Thank you so much, Professor Amin. So, so grateful to you. So grateful. And thank you all very much. This has been a real pleasure and it's it's been a lot of fun. So, I, I, as I said, I feel very honoured and uh, it's thanks once again. Thank you so much, Professor Amin. You'll be well. Thank you so much. So grateful. Bye. -bye.